Hello. Hello, people of the future, since no one's watching live yet. Hi. Um, this is Skix. This is Wednesday the 18th, uh, day after St. Patrick's Day, so we're getting ready for Easter, or perhaps this is the Mad March Hare. Um, so let's chat. Um, some of you might be curious about where I'm at, so uh, I'm going to start with a quick rundown. Um, I'm staying at home for the most part. I'm going for long walks. My uh, performances are all cancelled or, or postponed until who knows when. Um, my day job working at Dreamscapes continues even though Dreamscapes is closed. Um, there is work to be done uh, that doesn't involve interacting with the public. So um, they are very uh, generously keeping us uh, employed and paid. Um, in part because the Utah Arts Alliance has done an amazing job of um, stocking up for a rainy day. How long this can last, I do not know. But once things calm down, assuming we're still able to, I think we will find a very grateful public um, coming to us. Um, we are researching and brainstorming various ways to get um, online interest, um, uh, so, uh, possibly doing a virtual tour of Dreamscapes, uh, possibly, uh, doing some online, um, live painting or art tutorials, uh, possibly doing some, uh, online sales of, uh, the boutique items, um, so, uh, so that is stuff that's on the way. I will, as much possible, be part of that, partly because I have some skills, partly because I have some interest, and largely to get out of the goddamn house. As for the shows, Gonza Rising um, was not planning to have an April show. Um, the, uh, where was I? Oh, Gonza Rising was not intended to have an April show, but we are considering doing a virtual show which may take one of a few different formats. We may assemble the artists and film a show, or we may have the artists um, shoot their own acts and assemble them together, um, either by uh, submitting them to me and I'll upload them across a schedule, or possibly splicing them together into a show. Um, we're discussing options. Um, I'm also working with St. Josephine's Home for the Unloved Arts, which is uh, newly authorized by the uh, IRS as a 501c3 um, to get, um, <laughs> yes, I guess FAMKey is, uh, to get um, donations available. Um, and if uh, we get a Gonzo show and set up for people to be able to donate, we'll probably funnel that um, to St. Josephine's who in turn will use that in various ways to support the uh, performing arts community as well as we can. Um, that's all in very early stages. I think we are a bit late to coming to terms with the reality of how this is going to affect us. Um, but we've got time to work on it. Um, so I'm very fortunate that I'm not unemployed during this period. Um, if you are if missing work during this period, I am told that um, unemployment is available to you, but my guess is it will take so long to process, we might be done by the time you get your first check, but that's okay. That might still be useful, um, because um, if you're losing work, um, the second work returns, you may not be able to um, pull yourself up to the hole that, that you wound up in. Uh, if you're lucky enough to have a job to come back to at all. If you're lucky enough to have a job that you can work from home, that's great, good on your employers. Um, I think a big part of what's going on here is we're seeing what's possible that we had been told was not possible. Um, so working from home, helping each other, um, uh, improving the environment. Um, air quality is amazing uh, right now in a lot of places. Uh, so we should get used to that and, and set that as our goal now that we see what it's like. 
So, uh, what shall I talk about today? Uh, if anyone has any specific requests, um, please speak up. Uh, topics uh, I have on my little list include uh, vocal lessons for monsters, um, how to play the mouth harp, um, the history of pride, uh, reading from some of my stories, um, and uh, no one has submitted any creative writing to a uh, review, so I don't have any of that. Um, but that is uh, something that I'm willing to do, uh, and would love would love the opportunity to take some of my skills and and use them during this time. Um, after this call, my uh, plans for the day include painting, going for a really long walk, visiting with the pet rats. Um, what else is on my to-do list? Uh, I have a review to work on and um, starting research into getting um, banking in order uh, so that we can take uh, donations um, and early research into how to possibly do a virtual show. If any of you out there are performers that have worked with Gonzo Rising or me before, and have or can create a video clip of your act, please send it to me. Um, I, I don't think I have the means to send a little uh, text clip or a link, uh, but it, uh, the easiest email for me is skixual, skix, U-A-L, S-C-I-X, U-A-L, uh, skixual at gmail.com. Um, and, and in fact, if anyone wants to send me a video clip, an audio clip, a text clip, um, I will find various ways to uh, promote it, to use it as part of Gonzo Rising, or uh, in other ways. It's a crooked. Um, I have a bunch of amusing hats, so um, for the next week at least, I can wear a different hat every day. Um, and this is intended to be a daily thing. So, I'm going to start with the mouth harp. This is a fancy one from Russia. Um, it's a, a sword style, also called a jaw harp and a Jew's harp. We will not be calling it a Jew's harp. That is actually um, a corruption of jaw harp. Nothing to do with Jewish people ever. Uh, oh, the earthquake, yeah. Um, it affected me by waking me briefly, me thinking to myself, is that a big heavy truck going by or an earthquake and then going back to sleep? Um, the uh, earthquake epicenter was in Magna, which honestly is a bit of a shithole, um, and uh, honestly I don't want anyone to come to harm, um, but if Magna got raised and recreated, it might not be bad for it. Um, we, uh, uh, the uh, Utah Arts Alliance Art Hub uh, lost power, the uh, airport lost some ceiling tiles and had some flooding, um, we didn't even have interrupt interruption of, of anything. Um, and honestly, we are right on a big road, and I, I really did wonder if it was just a big truck going by. Um, I have lived in California and Maine, and both places have had um, more earthquakes uh, than Utah, apparently, considering how people are reacting. Um, there will be aftershocks, uh, probably, possibly, I don't know. I've, I've only felt one aftershock that I was uh, clear was an aftershock. Um, and we were in a vehicle and it kind of jounced a bit. So, jaw harp or mouth harp? If you've got one, you should bring it out. And if you don't have one, they're not very expensive. Uh, this one was a fancy one and was about 30 bucks. Um, most of them are even cheaper than that. Uh, you put it, you put it to your mouth, uh, a lot of people think you, you bite on it, but you don't. Uh, the, the tongue makes a little, a little twang on its own, and then it uses the chamber of your mouth like the chamber of a guitar, it, it, it magnifies and projects the sound. Um, and this, uh, Use of the mouth harp as you watch can also uh, help train you for use of your voice. Um, so, so the the only thing that's making a change in the sound is me moving my tongue around. Okay. 
That is um, holding the inside of my mouth the, the same way my normal voice does, right? Fairly relaxed in there. Um, but if you've had some vocal training, or, or perhaps you naturally do this, um, if you expand the space inside your mouth, um, which uh, creates a more resonant voice, uh, like like this, and it... it um, it's not necessarily actually louder, but it carries further, uh, and that's what resonance is. And some people have a naturally res resonant voice, and they are often accused of not having an indoor volume in their natural talk, um, and they, they often don't know how to help it. Um, but it's, uh, at least in, in most people, it's caused by uh, tensing some of the muscles that uh, in, in the throat and the soft palate of your mouth, and it... Um, creates a larger resonant chamber for your voice and it will do the same for the mouth harp. Uh, I'll, I'll start with normal and then I'll expand. And you can hear how it drops the sound and it, it has kind of a more electronica sound. Um, I haven't had this very long, and I still occasionally smack my teeth with it, like that. Um, so that's the mouth harp. Um, most of them are actually kind of more um, like this shape uh, than this, and they have more space between the tongue and the thing. Um, I like this. I saw someone doing this uh, online, and I, I ordered one because um, I like to be extra fancy. And sort of by uh, experimenting with some of the things I knew about vocal technique and about the, the interior anatomy of the vocal chamber, the, the sinuses, the mouth, and the throat, um, and then I, I discovered that it that that was the way to make that weird techno sound. And if you've never done that, um, the way my voice teacher taught it is to imagine the soft palate, which is the um, the back part of the roof of your mouth. Uh, 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 the front part is hard, and in back it's soft. Um, that actually has muscles in it, or a muscle, or it, it itself is a muscle, I'm not entirely sure, but it's, you can flex it. So imagine it like opening an umbrella in the back of your throat. Oh, so like this, and then, oh, 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 oh. Um, now some people will actually gag the first time they do that, so, um, if that's you, don't overdo it, um, but if you want a resonant voice, there are some advantages. As I say, it carries without raising volume. If you've uh, done any voice training or if you've worked at Fear Factory, uh, you know we talk about projecting from the diaphragm. That um, simply creates a higher volume. It does not create a greater resonance. So higher volume carries further, um, but resonance carries further without adding to the volume. So that is one advantage, is it carries. And if you want your voice to carry the furthest, you want to do both things. Um, and you want to practice them to the point where you no longer have to think about it as you do it. Um, it's sort of like if you have to think about breathing, you're going to start breathing funny. If you think about walking, you start walking funny. But if you um, do breathing exercises for projection and resonance over and over and over, ev eventually you can do it without thinking about it too hard. Um, the other thing, when you do the resonant voice, sometimes it vibrates your face uh, and tickles. That's kind of funny. Um, again, you want to do it over and over until uh, you can do it naturally without thinking about it. Um, the other neat thing uh, about doing the resonant voice is if you're someone who always hates the sound of your voice in a recording, that is largely because in your own ear you hear your voice um, resonating your skull bone bone conduction right and your recording doesn't 
have that. Your recording is at a distance, so um, the, the recording device and, and other people don't get bone conduction version of your voice, so it sounds smaller to you, right? Your recording sounds smaller to you. Um, if you practice resonant voice, that replicates the, the bone conduction in your own head, and you wind up with a voice recording that sounds much more like what you hear in your own head. So people who hate the sound of their voice, if they practice resonant voice, um, then that will improve their voice in recordings. And, and overall, people react well to a resonant voice. And if you practice it enough, perhaps you will um, have the resonant voice become your normal voice, or sort of save it on a shelf for when you need it. Um, but definitely use it when you're recording, uh, when you're singing, and when you want to be heard at a distance. Now, uh, for monsters, um, this is very useful. If you do resonant voice without projection, you can carry it, uh, the, the sound will carry well, even though it's relatively quiet. And uh, depending on the nature of the room you're in, if it has any kind of echo at all, uh, and I know a lot of our spaces are uh, surrounded with foam, which does not echo, um, with practice and care and luck, um, you can make a sound so that you sound very close to the ear of, of the guest, um, even when you're some distance away. It can be very startling, and that's very useful as a monster uh, to develop that technique. Um, I can't always do it, but I can sometimes do it. Um, and I suspect, as with everything else, I can practice it uh, and get better at it, the trouble is, it's hard to get feedback on whether it's working or not. Because um, uh, uh, if you make a noise and the guest flinches and you're farther away than normal, uh, you get that, but sometimes people don't react. Um, there's background music going on. Um, so possibly with a friend, go into a place that has a bit of an echo and practice uh, back and forth. Um, but that is resonant voice and the mouth harp. And if you have a mouth harp, um, that's a good way to practice opening the chamber because you have a very clear and obvious change in the sound, whereas the change in your voice can be subtle from inside your head. Uh, so there, there's that. I spent years practicing the resonant voice. When I was in the Navy, I was a broadcaster in the Navy, uh, and we went to broadcast school. Um, which was actually, if you've seen Good Morning Vietnam, uh, Adrian Cronauer, the person the movie is based on, went to the same school I went to, um, the Military uh, Armed Forces Information Services School? APHIS? No, Armed Forces Defense Information School, D-Info-S, Dinfos, Dinfos. Um, so uh, so uh, they had their way of teaching it, and that was the only way. So the way they taught it was, you do um, kind of a scale, like a swoop scale, from lowest to highest, and sometime uh, you get that yodel and then you go into the head voice, but sometime before you get to that yodel, you get to a tone that, that kind of vibrates your face, you know, and if, if, you, if you practice it. Some people, depending on the, the size of the interior anatomy, uh, it's more subtle than others, but you do that, and sometimes it'll actually clear your sinuses. So if you're stuffy, this is a fun exercise to do. Oh, I'm about there for me, um, and that will tend to naturally open the the, the muscles um, and and the chambers in in your face. Um, and then once you have that experience, the teacher said, "Okay, now figure out how to do it so your voice always does that." That's what it feels like to resonate. Now, figure out how to do that so your voice always does that. And that's it. That's all. And, and um, until I experienced the resonant voice, I didn't know what it sound lo sounded like. When they demonstrated it, it was hard for me to differentiate it because it can be a very subtle effect. Um, eventually, I got it. And then much later, when I was getting into some musical theater and I was taking voice lessons for that, um, the teacher gave me the, the, the opening the umbrella um, thing. That was immediately easy for me. 
Um, and so those are two methods that I've, I've uh, been taught by. You got that now. Um, if you are self-isolated enough that you can practice this at home, I recommend you do it. Uh, as always, practicing voice in the shower is good because you get the um, the the echo back from from tiles, and um, that gives you uh, a good feedback as to what your voice sounds like. So that's uh, voice and mouth harp. How is everybody doing? Um, Looks like there are only three of you on at the moment. Um, anyone anyone want to share a little bit of what you're up to? Um, I will continue doing these uh, on short topics. Um, please message me if there's a topic you want me to cover. Um, I'd be willing to, to do most anything to do with uh, acting, to do with... Thank you, Bryce. Uh, to do with writing. Um, and you know what topics I'm not even particularly familiar with? I will research for you. Um, the, the, the history of the LGBT uh, community. Um, what else? Um, heraldry I used to study. I could probably bone up on that. Uh, my French is really weak, so I probably shouldn't be teaching anyone that. My sign language is really, really rusty, so I shouldn't be teaching any of that. And my Aramaic is so limited, I only know one sentence. Yeah, I hear you. Um, probably the, the last thing on my, my to-do list, motivation-wise, if I order it by motivation, is is the stuff that's actually kind of work-from-home stuff, which in this case is just the movie review. Um, and I love movie reviewing, but for whatever reason, my, my motivation circuits will occasionally pick one thing from my to-do list and say, ah, anything but that. Um, and it's even if it's stuff I enjoy. Um, but, uh, what I often do to circumvent that is to, um, sort of collect tasks that I never want to do, like, uh, let's say laundry, right? And so I will set myself the task of doing laundry for the day, and then I will do the writing as a way of procrastinating the laundry. Um, got to trick myself, uh, particularly if you have any, uh, executive function issues, um, any mental health issues that affect your uh, motivation, um, that works surprisingly well. Just just kind of trick your, your motivation into uh, a diversion. Um, if you're going to procrastinate anyway, procrastinate uh, some things by doing the other things. Um, and then uh, carry it over the next day uh, or um, kind of switch it up. I don't know. These are techniques I have found to work um, before I started getting into really good therapy. Um, so I, I had a lot of coping mechanisms. Some were healthy, some were not. That's one that's not unhealthy. Um, sleeping all day is one, and that's not particularly healthy. Uh, <laughs> zoning out into TV all day is not particularly healthy, although distraction from distress uh, can be perfectly healthy. Perfectly fine uh, strategy. Um, just, you can overdo it, like anything else. Uh, okay, here's one thing I'm going to do, and then I'm going to sign off. Uh, I'm going to take one of the novels, either complete or one I'm working on. Okay, A Cozy Nook. So, the premise of A Cozy Nook is, um, that a, a young man, um, uses his inheritance to buy a small bookstore in a small town in Maine, that's where I grew up, uh, and his, uh, he's settling there, he, he grew up in the city, but he came to the small town because this is where his folks were from, and he wants to take an opportunity to um, kind of get a handle on what their life was like, and perhaps research, because there are some mysteries to his, uh, his ancestry. Um, and so here's the opening sequence of A Cozy Nook, which contains at least two things that writing advice uh, uh, lists always tell you to never do. Let's see if you can spot them. Uh, and, and this is the only one of, of all the works in progress that's in first person. Um, I normally, I often start in first person, but, but switch to third part way through, and then I have to go through and edit. But this one is very personal, um, 
and it keeps me from head hopping, which is something I tend to do, which is where you, you go from one point of view to another to another to another uh, without justification of the change. And part of that is um, I, I'm kind of trained up on things like Twin Peaks, where, where the, the show will do that and just hop from person to person and create almost a, a montage of the entire town. And that's how I like to write, but it doesn't work. It's not effective. Uh, first person, I can't do head hopping. I mean, I could, but it... Eh. Um, so, a cozy nook. I was first in, so I unlocked the little newsstand where I spent my days and turned on the coffee maker. There were stacks of papers waiting in the entryway, and I pulled the plastic banding off the stacks and loaded them into the racks. It was ten minutes to opening, and Ben still hadn't shown up. I grumbled, but not too hard. I'd opened by myself before, and it was a weekday. Sometimes on weekends, there would be people waiting in line before I even opened the shop. I pulled a stack of cash and a handful of coin rolls out of the office safe and loaded the cash register. I looked out of the front window. Still no sign of Ben. All right, I was going to open. I watched the clock and counted down. Three, two, one, and my alarm went off. I slapped the off button and sat up. I have the most boring dreams, I said. I opened my eyes, and the morning sun on the lemon-yellow wallpaper smacked me in the face. I couldn't decide if I hated it or not. It reminded me of my grandmother. Somehow. Which wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Well, time to up up. I threw back the coverlet and chuckled to myself for the fourteenth time as I noticed that I had slept only on one side of the queen-size bed. Me and my invisible boyfriend, I guess. I had about an hour and considered going back to sleep. And the boss, after all, what happens if I open late? But no, I got up, stomped naked across the wooden floor, went into the bathroom that was always chilly, and did those necessary things a young man needs to do to keep presentable in public, then got dressed. Um, and it goes on from there. So, the the things in that passage that they tell you to never ever do, opening with a dream, um, and opening with, um, I got up, got out of bed, dragged a comb across my head, uh, sort of, uh, uh, discourse. Um, so, uh, I kind of like the opening dream simply because he, he wakes up with, with a quip about having boring dreams, but from a practical sense, opening with something that I acknowledge is boring, probably not the most effective thing. Um, this is good for first draft. Um, this sort of sets things in motion, um, but in uh, a, a later revision, probably I will start the story further down the line when something is actually happening. Because right now, buttering your toast, uh, taking a shower, not interesting, doesn't actually tell us much about the, uh, the main character, aside from the fact that he once worked in a retail establishment of some sort, is a young man, and probably gay. Which, I mean... That's not a bad amount of information for the first page, now that I think about it. But more important than any of that is what is he like? What's his personality? What's he about? Um, and none of that shows up yet. Um, so uh, that's uh, the opening passage of A Cozy Nook. Um, it's boring. It's not bad, it's just boring. Um, so, yeah, when I get to the point of doing revision on that... Um, I will probably slice all of that out and start um, probably uh, probably a bit over one page later when a customer comes in complaining about how um, naughty Lord of the Flies is. That's the first something happening. Um, so that's probably where I'll start. Uh, but for now, for a first draft, the idea is to get words on the page and to keep moving forward. And um, if I uh, focus on the opening passage, I'm less likely to write page uh, 182. Uh, well, where am I? It is 91. I'm on page 91 so far. Skip to the part where he gets et by a groove. Well, that's that's probably a, a bit further down the line. Um, and just uh, a little hint about where the story's going. Um, the, uh, his, his parents were uh, shunned by society because they were, they were a mixed-race couple. 
um, from a ways back, his grandparents. Shoot, I've forgotten what generation I was writing about. I think his grandparents. Um, and uh, his parents are gone, so he's trying to research his grandparents. Um, and uh, he eventually learns, uh, we get a bit um, hot fuzz here. There's, there's kind of a, a secret society-ish in this small town. Um, and things that have happened to his parents and grandparents were connected. Um, and he also finds uh, someone that knew his grandfather runs a circus, and so I get to write about a circus, uh, which is always fun. Um, uh, okay, so I think... Yes, it is grandparents, right. Um, I th think he talks to... Uh, an uncle or a step uncle. Uh, I, I honestly, I have to reread it myself. It's been a while, um, uh, and and some of the finer details are are less, uh, you know, are, are a little bit window dressing to the the overall story arc. Uh, all right, I think. Oh, I'm glad. Uh, Rachel has been with me as uh, a first reader for some time now. Uh, and so they know, uh, they were the first to read Eastern White Pine, they were the first to read Patchworld, uh, they have read, um, a big portion of, uh, Impulse Controlled, um, uh, up until my, my recent re revisiting, um, and have probably, I think, read all of A Cozy Nook as far as I've written it. Um, it's, it's a cozy story sort of. Um, it's going to get scary because that's what I write. Um, there are bits that are a little unsettling, um, but mostly it's it's a cozy book. Um, and that might be the one uh, I focus on for a little while since the post-apocalyptic one is a little bit um, current events uh, for my taste right now. Um, and I, I, I'd rather be distracted from, from that. Uh, although, Current events will probably inform how I uh, re revisit that story when I come back to it, um, because I wrote kind of as a fairly sudden collapse of society, um, but um, a more tapered off collapse uh, might be more realistic considering the, the mechanism by which society crumbles. Um, and I'm seeing out my window kind of what tapering off society um, feels like. And even though uh, the apocalyptic uh, event is not a disease uh, per se, there is um, something to uh, the idea that keeping away from other people is a good plan. Um, so, so there's that. Um, I do have major motivation issues uh, in this story, um, and so that's kind of another reason why I've been procrastinating continuing uh, on the writing, um, because I've reached a point where all of the characters need to get moving, um, and so far I've written them with motivations uh, rain largely uh, on getting somewhere safe. Um, and that's not going to get them to uh, take a cross-country trek um, unless there's some reason to believe, for example, that Kansas is safe and then everyone's going to migrate to Kansas. And of course, if I do that, Kansas won't be safe um, because I'm mean to my characters. Um, but Ben, the main character in uh, Impulse Controlled, is... Uh, I talked about this yesterday. Um, is really interesting and I'm really enjoying writing him. Um, he's about to have a really tough time, and I've made a note in the manuscript of where he's going to go in case I forget by the time I come back. Um, but it's going to be rough on poor Ben, um, and it is definitely, um, to a certain extent, autobiographical, um, just kind of ramped up for dramatic purposes. Oof! Um... All right, um, maybe next time I'll read a bit from some of the other novels. Um, really love it if people would send me stuff that they'd, they'd want to see or talk about. Uh, if you've got any writing you want to share. Um, 
But uh, if not, I'm going to continue yodeling into the void. Hey!